there are my slides. Okay, um, great. Back to be back up here. Talk to you for for another 50 minutes about Conda. Um, we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive. It's not going to be too deep. Um, and uh, basically, the deep dive part is going to be talking a little bit about what I'm what I'm calling Conda anatomy. Um, and, and we'll go that into that in the first part. Second part is I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what makes Conda special. Um, what's so different about Conda from from a bunch of other package managers? And then uh, uh, at the end, I'm going to show you two more two more little things that I, I didn't get to yesterday that I actually I actually want to want to um, walk you guys through. Um, so here's part one. Conda gross anatomy. Um, <laughs> so, so most of the time, what people interact with, what, what users see, is the is what I consider the top interface, the the command line interface of Conda. There's another one at the bottom. Um, the the bottom interface is um, or or API is basically uh, the Conda packages and, um, and and channels and basically everything that ends up on disk and JSON files and all that. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that and, and show you uh, show you how some of that works. So if you if you want to dig in, you can. Um, so so the three things I'm going to walk you through are Conda packages, Conda channels, and and then what's in a, actually I called it Conda prefix, uh, Conda environment. Um, we use the word prefix and environment pretty in interchangeably. Um, all right, the anatomy of a Conda package. Uh, so what is a Conda? A Conda package is just a tarball, uh, tarbz2 file. And uh, what makes a tarbz2 file a Conda package is this info directory. Um, and I've got, I've, yeah, screenshots today. Uh, got it listed here, and there's a few things I want to walk you through in this info directory. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna walk you through everything, um, but the first thing is every single Conda package has the recipe embedded in it, the way it was built, everything you need basically to rebuild the package except for the actual source code because these are binary um, packages, uh, is embedded already in the recipe um, in the package. And then, uh, so I'm going to show you a couple more files that are in here that, that are pretty important to Conda's install operation. Uh, so the first one is um, basically, if this file isn't in the Conda in a tarball, uh, it's not a, it's not a Conda package. This index.json file. Uh, one of the things that's it does is it's used to build repo data um, that's part of a channel, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, it, it, it's, this is the source of truth for things like the package name, the package version, the build number. Uh, some of those things end up in the file name of the, of the Conda package. Uh, it can lie. This is the source of truth. Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, here it is. It's just a little bit of JSON, and uh, and there's a package name and version and, and everything else I, I described. Uh, second one is uh, this info paths file. Uh, so so that index JSON kind of descri was descriptive of the whole package, and it's basically it, it, it's yeah it's an identifier for the whole package. Paths are metadata about individual files in that package, um, individual files that will end up installing into an environment. Uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, so it's a list of paths. And um, at a minimum, we, we have uh, four fields here, uh, the actual path. Um, it's prefixed with underscore so that when you sort it, uh, it the path ends up first. Uh, the path type, they, we, can have, we can do soft links. Um, there, there's a couple other types that can be in these. The hash of the actual file at that path, and then the size, what we expect it to be. Um, there can be other things. Uh, so one of Conda's tricks is, is doing um, prefix replacement so that we can basically install, uh, install a package anywhere, even if it, anywhere on disk, even if it was compiled for, for someplace different. And, and so for binary files, that type of stuff's in here. It's also in here for text files. Uh, and the file type. The, so, so when you're doing prefix, th there's just other stuff. Um, we, we don't need to get into the details too much. Uh, one other file that's important for install time now. Uh, this is also descriptive of the whole package. Um, it's not a per path thing. But it's only used um, when we're actually going to install the file. It's this link.json file. Um, it's optional, 
so, so most packages actually don't have it. Right now, it's, I think the only packages that have it are the noarch Python packages. Um, so there's things in here that, that uh, kind of customize the specialization or customize the installation of, of the package. Uh, so uh, entry points, if, if a package needs to have entry points made, um, that it is a noarch Python package, stuff like that. One other, there was one other file that I pointed to in there. This is not part of a conda package. Um, this is actually what, what I showed you was an extracted tarball after conda had extracted it into the package cache. And this um, conda actually writes right after, it's extra, uh, after it extracts a tarball. Uh, and so it looks a lot like index.json. Um, except there's a little bit extra information. Um, the channel, the MD5 of the tarball, um, because you can't put the MD5 in the tarball, because it'll change the MD5 of the tarball. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the URL where it came from. All right, so that's a conda package. That's actually all there is. And they're, they're very human readable. Um, you can go in and dig around and, and explore on your own. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's actually all there for you to see. Um, now a conda channel. This is an example of a conda channel. This is our newest defaults channel. Um, it's actually the, it's the URL of a channel. Um, there's there's ends up being a lot to a channel. Um, one of the things channels have is subders. That's it's a technical word. Um, we call them subders. And uh, these are things like you've seen at Linux 64, Win 64, Win 32, things like that. There's also a noarch subder. Um, this is the common subder for all uh, for all for all subders. Basically, anytime uh, any platform-specific subder you might have, um, we will always fall back to a noarch subder, and that's actually how we end up detecting that a channel is actually a channel or a URL is actually a channel or not. Um, each subder has a repo data.json file, and uh, this is pretty important to how the solver actually works. So I'll talk about the solver in a while. Um, this repo data.json file looks, it's, it's the index JSON, the, what I showed you out of a conda package earlier, the descriptive part, the, the package name, the version, stuff like that, kind of dumped into a single file for the whole channel, or the whole subder in this case, uh, and uh, including um, the hash and, and things like that. And, uh, the, the stuff that's in here will actually end up looking a lot like what's in repo data, um, the, the repo data record.json that I showed you earlier. So we have a record of that after we extract the package. Uh, right, it's especially critical to the solver. Uh, there's a new file, new fairly recently. It's not, anaconda.org doesn't support it yet, but conda index does. Um, and it's this channel data.json file. It sits at the level of the channel and not into a subder like repo data does. Uh, so, so this is, yeah, so normally there would be a, a subder here and then uh, repo data.json. This is channel data.json. Basically is descriptive of, um, of the whole channel and uh, the latest updates to the channel. So packages that are in the channel, um, descriptions, um, descriptions for them. Let's see. There's no, there aren't good descriptions here. Huh. Should have pulled a better screenshot. Um, so summaries, descriptions, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes icons and yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so the anatomy of a conda channel URL. Uh, it's not, it, it actually can get kind of complicated. Uh, let's look at a simple one. Um, so channel alias uh, is configurable and you can move it around uh, if you need, need to point to uh, like a interpri different enterprise uh, repository or something like that. The default value is conda.anaconda.org. And uh, if we look at, uh, try to dissect ConduForge's channel, um, there, I, it's pretty easy to do. I, I think you, can, you could pretty readily map um, the parts of, uh, of, of what a channel URL ends up being. Um, the important part is that a channel has both a location and a name. Um, the name doesn't change. The location can move around. Uh, so ConduForge is always ConduForge, whether it's at conda.anaconda.org or some mirror that you, or server or whatever else that, that you've got somewhere else. Uh, and then, okay, here's a more complicated example. Uh, channel alias something. And you, uh, there, there's part of a path here too. Um, so splitting this up, can end up getting pretty complicated. 
Uh, I think we've got the logic down pretty well now, but uh, just just the, this is to demonstrate that uh, channels, cha uh, there, there's lots of parts to a channel that aren't necessarily always obvious. Um, oh, another tip. Uh, you can use file-based URLs. For uh, if you have something local on disk, um, run conda index on a, on um, a bunch of tarballs that are conda packages, and uh, and point conda to it, and that's that's just a local channel. Okay, um, last thing we're going to talk about for anatomy is the anatomy of a conda environment. Um, what we also call prefix. There we go. All right, so. Uh, I was looking through my environments. I had this environment called Nginx test. It's as good as any to look at how this all works. Uh, the thing, I, we, we have the typical uh, FHS file hierarchy standard file structure, Unix file structure. That's how, how um, our, that's our orientation, how, how, how we base things. And the special part that makes a conda environment, a conda environment, is this conda meta directory. Uh, specifically, if I'm going to tell whether a folder or a directory on disk is a conda environment, I look for this file right here. If that file is there, it's a conda environment. If it's not, it's not a conda environment. What is that file? Uh, it is the history, um, everything, every operation you've ever done on the whole environment. Um, and so we have the command you ran to get there, the, uh, the packages that uh, the solver ended up choosing and got installed. Uh, and extra information like that. So there's other files in there. There's basically, a, there is a JSON file for every single package that's in the environment. That looks like this. Um, this, you'll notice, ends up looking a lot like um, index.json. But it also looks like pass.json here, right? Um, it, and it looks like a couple other things, too. And it ends up, it, it's, it's, um, it's a superset of all the other information uh, that, that we need um, to, to manage that package in the environment. Um, if you mess, okay, if you go in and mess with these text files, you will mess up conda. Fair warning, okay? <laughs> um, conda depends on those. All right, anatomy class is over. Um, you survived. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so the next uh, part, um, this is the fun part, actually. Uh, what makes conda special? I like talking about this. Um, okay, I might end up throwing a little bit of shade at a couple other package managers. Um, it's all in good fun. Pip is really important to Python um, and the Python ecosystem. It has a really, really important part. Um, but you know, I might, I might have a few comments here and there. Um, what does Conda do? What is Conda? Um, actually, it boils down to two things. We have two fundamental units of work and pretty much nothing else. We uh, work with packages. And then we work with environments that are collections of packages. That's all we do and all we manage. Um, and that's important to keep in mind because uh, we don't want we don't want to go too far outside of uh, outside of our swim lane, outside of our boundaries. Um, what is Conda not? And I want to be clear about this. Uh, Conda is not configuration management. We are not Salt or Ansible or Puppet or Chef. You can use Conda for configuration management if you really want to. We allow you to have what's called post-link scripts, and if you really want to, it will fail. Uh, you, will, you will fail. <laughs> Your life will be miserable. Don't do it, OK? <laughs> um, we don't do process management. We are not an init system um, or, 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 or monitor processes. And then uh, oops, we don't do schema management. Um, we don't do schema migrations. We don't track the shape of your data uh, and make sure the shape of your data is compatible from, from one environment to the next. Um, there may be schemes that can be built on top of Conda to do that, but that's not Conda's purview right now. So um, a lot of people like this saying, do one thing and do it well, and that's, that's sort of what I was getting at with, you know, we only do two things, packages and environments. Um, and I'm not sure that quite applies for us. Um, I, because I think I think there's more to it. I think it's more nuanced. I think a couple other. Uh, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of the um, projects in Python might and the ecosystem might aspire to that. Um, I mean, pip is here, um, and then virtual env like packages, environments. Maybe pip should stay with with uh, packages, and virtual env should stay with environments. And that would fit to this. But then, uh, but then along came pip env. So, so that was a little confusing. I guess we use pipenv now. Um, but then, you know what? We we we've always had 
packages, or I mean, packages how, like, dis we, we still use distutils. Um, if you look at our recipes, setup.py, half of them still use distutils, but then half of them use setup tools. I mean, and they're kind of doing the same thing. And then now we have wheels, and wheels and executable. And then we have audit wheel. And well, if you start working with virtual env, there's virtual env wrapper, and um, py env, and actually there was py env, and, and pew, and then pipsy with, it's, it's a new thing. And uh, yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> um, maybe we want to be a little bit more controlled than this. <laughs> And, um, and that's, that's actually a luxury we have that the, the more open community doesn't. Um, and actually, if you look at Git, um, Git hasn't changed a lot in the last, you know, since, yep, this is it. Um, OK, there's a lot more under Git help dash A. But uh, these are the core functions. Um, and and it's, Git, Git manages a lot. And I think of our command line interface as a lot closer to Git than to, to some of these other things, probably. Um, so, so even though we have a couple of separate projects, we're, we're managing, like, everything enters through the conda command. Um, we, we are one, basically one project. Um, I, I have start, I have an asterisk by conda build because you know what, it's, it's a separate package, but it's still a conda command. Um, everything or, everything is within conda. Um, constructor, uh, it's, it's its own thing right now. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, in my opinion, that um, parts of it get, get divided into conda and conda build eventually. I have no idea, but um, that I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, all right. Fundamental architectural differences between conda and pip. This is important, actually. Um, and, and I think it, it, it gives you a lot of light into um, the, the things that might you might feel, but, but are more, uh, more gut level, and you never quite knew how, how to describe it before. So let's look at a conda environment. Um, here, here's what it looks like. You, know, uh, you, ha you have your environment on disk, and um, conda starts at the root of the environment, the, the base prefix, what we call a prefix. Um, that's where conda starts and works down from there. Um, so, so that's conda's starting point. Um, if we look at pip, um, pip starts at site packages, right? Pip's job is to install Python packages. Conda's job is to install packages. Pip's job is to install Python packages. Um, pip starts at site packages. And then it yeah, installs some stuff into site packages. And then, oh, by the way, I need some entry points. So I'm going to jump back up and put some, put some stuff up there. But oh, yeah, I need some data, too. <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump around. and. Oh wait, I want my what I'm pip installing here to be on my system path, and so I'm gonna let pip do something in user local bin. But then, oh wait, I don't have permissions to install where I think I where pip is actually at, so I'm just gonna end up putting something in the home directory. So so you can see how um, uh, how the two how the two perspectives end up being um, being a little different. Um, and, and this gives us some advantages. I mean, we're not installing um, Python packages. We're installing packages. Uh, you can't pip install GCC, right? You, I mean, that's absurd. You never even think of it. Um, you can't pip install Nginx. You can kind of install Nginx. Um, you can't pip install Python. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's fundamentally a difference that we're all go always going to have. And it, Gets, it's down to um, conda operates at a level of abstraction higher than pip does. Um, we're, we're looking at, at the, f I mean, and then pip does a, implements a bunch of hacks to kind of work around, work around its, you know, its primary focus, its primary level of abstraction. Um, we start at the root of the environment and work down, and we don't go outside it. Uh, so those, those were some differences between conda and pip. Let's talk about conda and virtual env. Conda environments and virtual env. Um, so I created a virtual env. I called it virtual env. D you can do that. Um, and let's uh, doing a list on three directories here. Uh, the, the virtual env directory that I just created, uh, virtual env lib, and, and uh, the not the site packages directory. Site packages is in here. The the standard library directory for for this environment for Python. Um, that's all there is in it. It's pretty lightweight. There's not, I mean, and maybe that's a good thing. There's not much, though. Um, and let's compare that to what a conda env looks like. Exact same thing. 
Um, so I just did oop, uh, create an environment with Python in it. That's what vir that's what the virtual in virtual in command did. Create a virtual env that you know has Python. Um, this is pretty much exactly equivalent. Uh, this is a full Python environment. Virtual env is a really lightweight wrapper around another full blown out Python installation. Um, and uh, for pure Python packages, it works great. Uh, we most of the world and most of our world isn't pure Python packages. Uh, you, you leak out to system libraries all over the place, and and you have no control over over where things are linking to and and what you're actually getting loaded into your environment. Um, and so the distinction is that Conda environments are not just for Python. You can use Conda environments for any language. Um, and you know, it, I, I, someday maybe maybe some of these other ecosystems will realize uh, that you know Conda is much more of a general tool, and it's not just for Python, which is kind of cool. Um, so Conda. Oh, what are uh, yeah? Okay, so the interface between Conda and the rest of the world. Um, what may, what, I mean, we, we do a lot. We have this prefix and install everything in it, but, we, uh, but you, you still need, we, we don't, there's no Conda OS, right? Or not yet, anyway. Um, so, so where are those interfaces, actually? It ends up, um, you, where, we, where we actually draw the line between what Conda installs and what Conda doesn't install is, uh, well, we don't, you bring your own kernel, um, and the, the libc interface, and, and the linker loader. So we um, depend on you having glibc and the associated linker or, or some other linker loader. Um, and it, that's a pretty slim requirement. There, there's not much else. Um, we basically are user space at this point. Let that sink in. It's kind of cool to think about. Um, I've got a little demo of this. Uh, so I'm doing this in a Vagrant environment on Linux, not my Mac, because of um, Mac OS is uh, um, the character limit, or um, all caps, what are, yeah, what, um, case sensitivity, thank you. Um, Mac OS by default is a case insensitive file system. Linux by default is a case sensitive file system. And so sometimes it doesn't work to unpack or, or work with um, you can to work with Linux tarballs on Mac OS. So that's why I'm doing this in, uh, in a, a Docker container, or a, actually a Vagrant box right here. Um, so uh, looking at, I, I have this image that I compiled, uh, BusyBox. Um, you can use the default one, but it's missing a couple of key libraries. Uh, so, uh, so I just compiled it myself. Um, it's pretty easy to do, and I can share the recipe. This is all that's in the image. It's four megabytes unpacked. It'll, it shows up as like one or two megabytes when it's tarred up, um, and that's what it shows on Docker Hub. That's all that's in it. Um, so you have your linker and, and your libc libraries associated with that. Um, so, oh yeah. so what I'm going to do is, I, I mean, I have this really slim Docker container. I'm going to basically cop clone an environment into that container copy it into the container. Um, here's the command I'm using. Oh, go back. Uh, so this is a little bit of an undocumented um, configuration parameter, but you can use it. Um, it's been there for a little while now. And uh, so, uh, while I'm installing, I, I make my root files, root directory, um, creating the environment here, where I am, current working directory. Um, but I'm going to say that my prefix, what I want all the prefixes to be written as is user local. Um, so I do that. Oh, okay, so I remove some um, some static libraries because we don't need them in a Docker container if the Docker container is going to be for Python um, and the Python that I want to run here. Uh, and then um, here here's the Docker file right here. Two lines, two lines to the Docker file. My BusyBox thing that I, that's this and uh, copy. And then um, build, and you have that. That's it. You can see it running, Python dash v. Um, it works, and it's well. Okay, it's 100 megabytes. Um, we can do better, maybe. Uh, th the point is that uh, the all w w we have the whole user space at this point. I use BusyBox because c uh, Python, most Python needs a shell. 
Um, it, uh, Python doesn't work very well without a shell. So, so I use BusyBox. We don't even have to use BusyBox. The, the bin director, there's a bin directory with BusyBox in it. You could wipe that out if you really wanted to. Um, Python ends up subprocessing to shells all the time, though. So, um, which brings me to Conda and Docker. Um, this is sideways. Hmm. Conda and Docker are really orthogonal technologies. Um, I, I, I mean, a lot of people ask, like, well, if I have Docker, do I need Conda? Or do they compete? Or what's the difference? Um, they're completely orthogonal. Uh, you, you have to get the bits into your container somehow, right? And I kind of just showed that. Uh, you still have a Docker file. I mean, you can create a Docker container with a Docker file. A Docker file is going to run yum or apt-get, or it should be running Conda, because Conda is your universal package management uh, API, your interface. Um, anywhere you work, you can use Conda install. Um, you don't, I am a DevOps engineer. Uh, I got sick of writing stuff like this. Uh, if I'm on Red Hat, then I have to do yum install. And if I'm on not Red Hat, it ends up being Ubuntu. Uh, and then everything else will just fail. Uh, I have to do apt get install. But then on Red Hat, the package I want is named, I mean, I want Apache, and it's named HTVD. And then but on Ubuntu, it's named Apache 2. And, and so you have to keep all, like, if you're doing DevOps work, you have to keep these maps and write all this extra code. Or, or you can just use Conda install. Um, so Conda install. Docker's a great technology. Uh, Docker's great for shipping um, uh, bottled up things to production, right? Um, and yeah, and it's completely orthogonal to what Conda does. Conda is about managing packages and environments. Um, cattle, let's see. Yes. Cattle not pets is a thing, right? Um, DevOps work. Uh, you don't want to have managed environments because they somehow mess up. Some, at some point, they become golden environments, and you never know how to qu quite recreate them. And so, so a lot of times, um, pet, you, under, you understand the distinction cattle and pets? I hope I don't have to. I'm, I don't want to explain it. But if, you, if you don't, um, cattle, <laughs> cattle are fairly disposable. <laughs> pets you want to keep around, <laughs> right? Um, that's, OK, that's it. Uh, so, so if you're shipping code to production, you want this bottled up thing that like, is a Docker container and, and is disposable. And if you have to wipe it out, you can wipe it out. It's not a big deal. Uh, but pets are more like databases or a database environment where it's constantly managed. And you do update it. Um, you update security stuff. Uh, you're not going to just constantly be wiping it out. That's, that's the distinction. Um, and Conda is, I mean, we can do, we can do pets. but or we can do cattle, but, but we do also do pets. You know what? Your de development environment, you want to keep your development environment over time and update it over time. You don't want to be constantly recreating your development environment. Um, that makes sense, right? We're particularly neurotic about this, all right? We spend, uh, we spend a lot of time well, what is that? on the Conda solver. It's what we call, yeah, we call, we call it the Conda solver. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. We spend a ton of time on it. We are completely neurotic about, um, about being as, as accurate as possible. Um, let's see. OK. Uh, other thing I want to mention here. Our defaults channel, uh, the metadata changes over time. What's in that repo data.json file? Um, that metadata isn't always what was in the original package. We actively manage this. And the reason is because when you build a package, um, you don't know, for, for the package's dependencies, you don't necessarily know what the upper bound is for when a dependency is going to become API incompatible with that package. right? You don't know where to put the upper bound. You only know that when it happens in the future. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest reason we, we actually actively manage um, all, all this repo data. Uh, yeah, we spend a lot of engineering on the Conda solver. Um, and, and we do dry runs, and we make sure, are you sure you want to do this before you actually do it? We show you everything we possibly can. Um, even if you use dash dash yes, always yes, yeah, we'll, we'll still show you the information um, in comparison to pip install and cross your fingers. Um, there's no dry run. Maybe it'll be in pip 10, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen it. I guess there's a download only. But um, there's no dry run. Nobody uses it. It's pip install and cross your fingers. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Why are we so neurotic about this? 
Conda install. Conda, what we do is kind of a, it, it's a big chunk of work, right? We touch a ton of surface area. And, um, and the other thing that we have is now transactions. So with all the surface area that we touch during, when we're mutating things on disk, anything can happen, anything at all. And um, we, we try to verify and make sure everything's as, as sane as possible and ready to go before we're actually changing things on disk. Um, but things still happen, right? There can be a, a, a permissions issue. There can be, like, that we can't detect until we actually try to write the file. Um, that's probably the most common one. There can be all kinds. I mean, there can be a bug in the Conda code, right? Um, and because that happens, sorry. And uh, if anything happens, we're going to roll your environment back. Don't, don't SIG kill the process, OK? We're going to roll your environment back for you and, and make sure that at least we leave your environment in a, in a good working state. All right. Um, I am going to show you two more things that, uh, that I didn't quite get to yesterday. Um, one of them is <laughs> more shade. <laughs> um, you can import Conda. <laughs> Um, I, I'm laughing because there's this recent pip issue uh, about pip, pip after 14, 16 months, something like that. Uh, pip released 9.0.2. 9.0.1 was like in December of 2016. Um, they released 9.0.2 and broke everybody who did import pip. Most, a lot of people. Okay, not maybe not everybody. I don't know if it's everybody. A lot of people who did import pip um, broke them. Uh, and there's a 9.0.3 that came out. Um, but it's kind of a fun issue to read through if you, uh, if you really want to. Um, I want to show you the, um, OK, so Conda's code base is written in Python. That me doesn't mean all of Conda code is, should be treated as public, OK? We, Python doesn't have public versus private. Um, I'm going to show you, I am going to go to this go GitHub issue right here, if I can. It's a good way to open it and um, show you a couple things on it. Um, because that ended up being the best summary. And this should go in the docs, obviously. We'll get there. OK, there are three different ways to import Conda that are supported. Um, one of them is, uh, and this has been, I think we introduced this in Conda 4.3, so that was like a year and several months ago, um, CLI Python API. This ends up, this pattern um, ends up being exactly how we run our integration tests um, for, for all of Conda. Uh, we're, um, we're, we're not subprocessing. We, we basically feed arg parse some stuff and then call execute on it. Um, pretty, it's pretty high level. Uh, and you can do that, but, but you can get out JSON stuff. Um, uh, so, so you can still not subprocess, but but work with it in a in a pretty Python um, in process way. Um, and pip used to have a dot main. I think if you were importing pip, I think they said they're still going to support it. But then there was some argument. I don't know. Um, so the second one, uh, and we're we're still working on solidifying this. And I've got beta marked here, but but this will will continue to grow and continue to solidify. Um, is conda api.py. Um, right now, there's four classes in here. Uh, the first one is solver. Um, so you're, you'll have to go through and look at the, all the documentation here if you want to. But basically, um, you uh, import Conda API, use the solver class. Um, it's a really good interface for working with, uh, you, you say, your prefix, and then the packages you want to add and remove from that prefix. Um, and then what you want to get back, whether you just want the final state of um, how things are going to change, if you want the diff, or if you want an object that you can call execute on and make it all happen if there are changes. Um, so it does, that's what that does. Uh, no loading. Uh, be, uh, there's other parts of, of um, places where the, or other software that use Conda in the past, and, and there's a lot of passing stuff back and forth, um, call, calling something from Conda, um, g getting an object or, or a map or something back, and then passing it back to Conda again and back and forth, and, and this solves all of that. Um, passing data back and forth is, isn't a bad is a bad pattern. Um, there's three other classes here right now um, that basically represent Conda's three sources of information. Um, Conda only has three sources of information. We have repo data, calling it subdir data here, because it's a subdir, um, and that's what it represents. 
uh, we have a package cache, which it's, a it's kind of the same. It, it has some nuances. It's a little bit different. So, so there's package cache data, and then we have prefix data. Um, those are our three sources of information. There's an API here for you to work with them, and it's pretty consistent about what you can do. There's, there's query, there's uh, load, and stuff like that. That is how you import Conda. Oh, one more thing. I guess I can go back to the slide. Where did my presentation go? There it is. The last one is Conda exports. Conda exports. Um, Please, if you are going, so, so this is a pattern that came out of um, Conda and Conda Build, trying to trying to work together, um, figuring out how you know um, before before Mike and uh, Mike Sarahan, who's the Conda Build tech lead, and I started working on Conda and Conda Build. Um, Conda and Conda Build were pretty much Elon and e Elon and Aaron, and and they worked really closely together, and um, and y if there was a change, one place you uh, you knew that. There was a change, and you could make it in the other place. Um, but we worked out this interface pattern. So um, Conda build has a Conda imports or a Conda interface uh, module that uh, Conda build brings everything from Conda through that one module. So it's all isolated in one spot. Um, and then Conda has an exports module that uh, I can keep track of to know that, you know what, if it's in there, it's special. This is tested, and we make sure we don't change stuff here. Um, and, and provide a shim for, you know, if we're going to deprecate a method, there, there, there's some compatibility room um, to, to fix up code in here, here, here and there. So, so you can use Conda exports, too, um, if, you, if you really need to get to some lower level stuff. Um, please don't import Conda or import other parts of Conda anywhere beyond this. If you need something somewhere, talk to me. Um, we'll put it at, at least in Conda exports, and we might make it put it in the API, too. Um, all right, we're going to give you one more of the tip and tricks. Um, um, I like this one. Um, so Conda Search just got a new flag recently. I guess it was in 4.5. Um, dash dash ims flag. Um, basically, it will let you search for a package, a match spec. Um, and you can customize this match spec any way you do Conda Search um, with a version or a channel name or anything else. Uh, It'll let you search for any package on disk. Uh, it'll search all your environments. Um, and you know, this is a great example, because how many people have outdated versions of OpenSSL? I mean, I do. <laughs> I shouldn't be showing this. And actually, after this demo, actually, I took the screenshot, and then I op updated all of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so OK. Uh, yeah, here, here's, the, here's the same command. I got some, some bash foo here, piping it to JQ to you know pull out. I, we're, we're using JSON because we should do that. But then um, piping it to JQ to just get the locations. And then just conda update open SSL. And I did the dry one. But, um, but you can see it's going through all my environments. And, and yep, um, you probably run into permissions issues if you don't do, yeah. Um, do sudo here. Don't usually use sudo. Um, the thing with kind of search ims is if you do this as root, um, as UID zero, or ad admin on Windows, uh, it will search all your users. Um, so, so if you do it as just a user, a non-privileged, non non-root user, uh, it's just going to look for the environments that are known for your user that your user has operated on. Um, if you do it as root, it will look for every. Uh, every possible environment on the system, and, and and it does this by looking at everybody's uh, uh, every every home directory and looking for a special environments.txt file that's in a conda directory there. Okay, um, I'm going to save time for questions. But um, so basically, what did we learn today? I gave you a little bit of a conda anatomy lesson. The the bottom side of the conda interface, um, what conda packages actually look like, uh, channels look like. Uh, environments actually look like, um, and what the data looks like inside it. It's really human readable. There's no binary stuff or anything. Um, that's kind of a cool thing about Conda. Uh, what makes Conda special? Um, I really like talking about that. And I guess you guys can tell. And then, yeah, another another couple tricks. And um, happy to take questions. If you didn't do any of this yesterday, please do it now. And happy to take questions.